James encourages us to pray in his epistle, chapter 5, noting that the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. So how then is our prayer life as a congregation and as individuals? Do we feel connected with God and St. Mary's? Or have we hit a dry patch and find it hard to focus on praying? To be honest, this past year and a half, we have been slammed by so much. Countless deaths, political stalemate, natural disasters, blatant racial and economic inequality, and the hectic withdrawal from Afghanistan. At times, we may have felt helpless and wondered how and what to pray in such overwhelming situations. Those who have been unable to attend in-person services at St. Mary's may have felt even more powerless in their isolation. And yet today, James urges us to pray in the very midst of our complex and imperfect human condition, <clears throat> in our suffering and in our cheerfulness, in our flaws and in sickness and healing, in our faithful fervency and in our wandering away from God. As Anne Lamott writes in her book on prayer, Help, thanks, wow. When we cry help to God, we release ourselves from the absolute craziness of trying to be our own or others' higher powers. Because our prayerful connection with God is the central element, binding us in our ups and downs to the only one who is the source of abundant life, power, wisdom, and hope. Well, James exhorts us to engage in a variety of forms of prayer, intercession, communal prayers for healing, public confession, thanksgiving, and songs of praise, which St. Augustine of North Africa in the fifth century said was like praying twice. We can pray brief arrow prayers while waiting in the checkout line. We in intercede together in the prayers of the people each week. We can spend time in solitude and centering in God. Well, Henry Nowen writes that solitude is one of the most necessary but difficult of spiritual disciplines because it's when we shut the door and close out the noise of the outside world that our own inner chaos instead makes itself heard. Our inner doubts, anxieties, bad memories, unresolved conflicts, angry feelings, and impulsive desires. Sch scheduling time into our busy schedules to be alone, still, and quiet is hard, but therefore all the more important, for it is as we develop an attentiveness to God's voice in us that later, the unquiet voices slowly withdraw as they receive less and less attention. Richard Foster, whose classic book is entitled Prayer, insightfully states that solitude crucifies our need for importance and prominence. Removed from where the action is, God can free us from our egomania. Then we can re-enter the hustle and bustle of the unspiritual materialistic world again with perspective and freedom. 
while writing to a dispersed group of Christian communities that have fled persecution, James highlights the need for prayer, not only in our individual lives, but also in our communal life. When sick, we are empowered to call upon our spiritual leaders to come and anoint us with oil, praying for our healing in the name of Jesus. And at St. Mary's in October, good news, we are looking forward to restarting the Thursday 11 a.m. healing service in our church. And since our sinful actions can affect our whole selves, our body, mind, and spirit, James tells us to confess our sins to one another humbly acknowledging that none of us has our act all together. We all need God's grace, God's healing and forgiveness. I will never forget the Lenten service of public confession at the Roman Catholic Church where I lived in community with students and our priest at Bristol University. I wept as I confessed to all that I had been running away from God and from people. This was a turning point in my faith life when I began to open up and trust people. Well, James gives us an example of powerful and effective prayer in Elijah in the Old Testament, who prayed fervently for his nation and land. Friends, if ever there was a moment for powerful intercession in our country and world, it is now, now. James encourages us to pray by, by assuring us that Elijah was a human being, just like us. If he could pray, so can we. In 1 Kings 17, Elijah announces to King Ahab a three-year drought because of the monarch's idolatrous leadership, and just so the heavens dried up. In chapter 18, after Elijah's amazing public victory of prayer to the one true God when he defeated the 400 godless prophets of Baal, finally the Israelites turn and confess that there is only one God. And Elijah then prays and God once more sends rain and fruitfulness to the land. Awesome answers, right? And yet, Elijah was not immune from the fear, the exhaustion, and the depression that many have felt this past year. After wicked Queen Jezebel seeks to kill him, Elijah runs away to a cave and just wants to die. And God sees his suffering and weak child. God speaks to his prophet in a still, small voice, in an unspectacular way this time, reassuring him that he is not alone. And God even sends Elisha, Elijah a helpmeet in Elisha. The prayer of the righteous is indeed powerful and effective. However, just as there is a danger of us giving up praying, there is also a danger in thinking that God answers us because we are, after all, so righteous. We can become arrogant and prideful and look down on others who are still waiting for an answer to their prayers. In truth, the only righteous man, the only perfectly righteous man who has ever lived is the Lord Jesus. 
So we who are brothers and sisters of Jesus in our imperfection, we humbly bring our petitions to the God who loves us all equally. And we pray in the powerful name of Jesus, who movingly is interceding right now for each one of us in heaven. And we trust our heavenly Father to hear the cries of our hearts, to answer as a good Father sees fit in God's time, not ours. I remember clearly when I was 20 years old at an airport in England praying specifically for a husband. <laughs> I remember that day clearly. <laughs> Seven long years later, I meet my husband, David. Let me tell you, that was a long seven years. So if the prayer of the righteous is effective and powerful, how can we become more righteous like Elijah? Well, Jesus gives us some pointers in Mark 9, our gospel reading. First, we are to open our hearts and welcome all who minister in Jesus' name, rather than being competitive and exclusive. One commentator notes the irony that earlier in Mark 9, the disciples cannot exorcise a spirit to heal the boy. And now, here's a non-disciple praying in Jesus' name, and he's successful. Go figure. The disciples are envious, and they are furious. Tell him to stop. But Jesus instead urges his disciples to pay attention to themselves. He warns his community about the importance of internal discipline so that other Christians are not led astray by bad examples. And the Lord is talking in hyperbole about lopping off our hands and feet and poking our eyes out in order to wake us up to taking our spiritual lives seriously. Will we take drastic measures to stop whatever is separating us from God? And positively, will we engage in those practices of prayer, confession, and church attendance as we are able that draw us closer to God? Friends, even if we were to cut off every one of our external limbs, we would still sin because the place where sin resides is in our hearts, inside, where it's invisible to everyone else but God. It's only God that can cleanse our hearts from hidden faults, only God who can give us a new heart by sending God's Holy Spirit of Jesus to live in us. So this week, then, we can reflect on how central prayer is in our lives. Is there room in our prayers for praise and thanksgiving, as well as listing needs? Who in your circle needs healing prayer? Who has wandered away from God for whom you can pray? because the prayer of the righteous is indeed powerful and effective in Jesus' name. Amen.